afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Donington Park and the second race, the eighth round of the 2019 Mini Challenge. The JCW class cars are very shortly going to be heading out onto the circuit, but we have got a short delay. There is a recovery process ongoing after what was a typically eventful VW Racing Cup event. Uh, a first lap shunt had left a couple of cars stricken to the side of the road. As you can see, Simon Walton who was the proud owner of uh, an immaculately prepared Audi TT. Now he's the proud owner of a slightly bent one, but uh, the front wheel will be fixed. They'll be back out next round. Thankfully, the driver's all okay, but because of suspension damage and wheels missing and whatnot, the recovery process has taken a little longer than planned. Whilst the recovery process has been ongoing, it started to rain. The next grid of cars is a field of nearly 30 identical minis, all of which will no doubt be sat there in the assembly area on slick tyres. So we are, I think, in for rather a dramatic 20 minutes of mini challenge racing. Andy McEwen up here to talk you through this second race of the day. I was joined by Joe Osborne this morning, and we're going to give you real value for money now. Three commentators for the price of one. Scott Woodwiss has joined me now for the second race. Now, Scott, the first race today was a good race, but it was probably the quietest mini challenge race we've had this season. I think we've got all the ingredients now for that to be completely reversed in race two. I know it's good race because I was there. Uh, oh, you were, weren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Joe Osborne's been around today, but yeah, no, you're right. You were there with me for Mini Challenge, yes. so you know just how uh, how good these races can be. Yes, and it was a fairly sort of roughly a bit of a stalemate, but even so, it was a bit of an interesting sort of battle between the front few cars. Not too many position changes, but a good bit of a stalemate and a good battle. We're going to see some images from what happened in the first race earlier on. Just talk us through it, Andy, because it was a, a, a bit of a stalemate, but still entertaining nonetheless. Well, Nathan Harrison started from pole position and really needs to try and take some points out of James Gordle this weekend. Gordle arrived here with a fairly healthy championship lead, just under 20 points. Gordle, the yellow machine number 18, slotted into second place early on. There was a big moment for Lee Patterson down at the Melbourne Hair, but I still don't quite know how he got away without hitting anybody. He would later to pull off into retirement. Keenan Dole pulled off into retirement with, we think, a mechanical issue on the opening lap, and that brought about a safety car. Upon the restart, Jack Davidson's car was disintegrating and had to pull off to the side of the road. He was another that joined the uh, the list of casualties. And at the front, James Gordle tried to chase down Nathan Harrison to no avail, though, and Nathan took his first victory of the year, the fifth different winner from the first seven races of what is turning into a highly competitive season of mini challenge racing. Gordle was second and third place went the way of Dan Zelos. This time around though, Scott, we've got a reversed grid or a partially reversed grid. The top six finishers from race one get swapped around, which means that Ben Palmer, the double winner from Silverstone last time out, he was a bit disappointed with that sixth place finish this morning, but actually it's worked out okay. He's now on the front row with his big title rivals a bit further back. Yeah, and he'll certainly want to make foot, foot, take full advantage of that and these opening couple of laps whilst the guys behind try to pick the way through the cars in front of them. Uh, but of course, as you can see, we have had some rain on the circuit, which means that these guys, mostly on slick tyres, on front wheel drive cars that tend to get pretty tail happy because they are quite light on the rear anyway. All I'm going to say is brace yourselves for the old hairpin first lap because it could get rather interesting, shall we say. Yes, these are front wheel drive and short wheelbase front wheel drive tin tops. So the front tyres do all of the work. They handle the steering, the bulk of the braking, and of course, all of the application of the power, the rear tyres really just keep the rear bumper off the ground. They don't really, obviously they're there for stability, but they don't have to handle much else. Now that's good because you don't wear out your rear tyres particularly uh, badly in mini challenge racing or any sort of front wheel drive racing, but getting the heat into them in the first place can be tricky. This morning, everyone did pretty well, but that's because the track temperature was up there in the region of uh, 30 degrees. Now though, the track temperature I'm sure has dropped uh, quite significantly. We've got rain that's been sort of coming in and out. It's not quite, uh, I don't think it's actually raining at the moment, but the circuit will be a little dampened greasy uh, and no doubt the drivers are going to really need this sighting lap now this green flag lap that's just beginning uh, to uh, fully appreciate where the grip is or perhaps isn't yeah track temperature around 21 degrees now uh, and a little bit of rainfall around as well so the green flag lap then gets underway we'll have a chance in a moment to run you through this partially reversed grid which as i said uh, is the top six finishers from race one reversed ben palmer looking for his third win of the year if possible lines up on pole position with lewis brown alongside jack mabin is third on the grid ahead of Dan Zelos, uh, fourth position. Then James Gordle, the points leader, but now by only six points, we think, over Nathan Harrison in second, in uh, sixth on the grid, second in the championship. Rory Cuff just missed out on the grid reversal. Tom Rawlings, likewise, they will share the fourth row of the grid. And on row five, rounding out the top 10, Matthew Wilson and Harry Gooding, who will be hoping that his brakes 
today in working order this weekend after a scary crash at Silverstone. Callum Musham and Dave Lukes are on the sixth row of the grid together. Row seven is shared by James Griffith and James McIntyre. And then all the J's together, James Lukes, James Griffith, then Jacob Andrews and James McIntyre, and then Josh Stanton, 15th on the grid, uh, and uh, Neil Trotter there, 16th as well. Matthew Rainbow and Stuart Gibbs are next. Matt Rainbow has uh, progressed from Janetta Racing, so from rear-wheel drive to front-wheel drive. He may have some difficulty getting rear tyre temperature up. Jacob Andrews and Lewis Gaylor are next. Lewis had a spin and collected another car at the hairpin. Had to pit for four repairs in race one. Jack Davidson, we saw something fell off his car. He pulled off at the side of the road to retire. Richard Newman was a retirement in the previous race. Lee Patterson, likewise. We don't know exactly what the issue is. I'm guessing something brake-related. Let's hope that's been sorted. Keenan Dole and Max Bird, both retirements. In fact, Max Bird didn't even start the first race he got as far as Redgate on the green flag lap and then was pushed back into the pit lane with problems so we've got some quick drivers coming from the back of the grid particularly looking at the likes of Jack Davidson Lee Patterson Keenan Dole and Max Bird in the pit lane confusion reigns now because right now yes it's damp but it's certainly not wet enough for wet tires if it rains even slightly harder though it may well be beneficial to come in and change onto wet but if you do that and then the rain stops it'll go back into the the, the comfort zone of those on slicks right now there is no right choice it's too wet ideally for the slicks to work at their optimum um, because it is a bit damp and cold out there but it's not wet enough for wet tires so what do you do it's a nightmare both for drivers and for crews because effectively either as a driver you ideally want it fully wet or fully dry if it's in between not only is it a nightmare for tyres but also try to set the car up because it means that you know exactly which direction you need to go if it's either a full wet or a full dry circuit in between it's it, it, with, with tyres with setup it's almost an absolute gamble you've got no exact concrete sort of way of how to set the car up properly we just saw the Jamsport crew there with several sets of tyres ready I'm sure that one car's probably going to change tyres is that man there Harry Goody because there were some orange rims on some of those tyres possibly he could be coming in to make a change because there is some rain in the air. Several cars, as you can see, have got their windscreen wipers on, which means that possibly they're going to have to try and fend off as much of the rain as possible. But um, this is going to be pretty interesting, of course. If we see even some drivers, if it does start to rain harder, if they start to make an early gamble and go on to wet tyres, watch for them in terms of their lap tyres, tearing their way through the field, whilst others either try and struggle out there to cope with dry tyres on an increasingly um, dampening and, and, and dampening track or possibly just going off and having to go in and make later stops when the others most benefit from taking that gamble early on. And the trouble is that you won't see any Formula 1 style two and three second pit stops either. It will take them a long time. They may even go a lap down. And that's why really you want to make the decision now rather than have to pit halfway through the race. At least if you pit now, there's a good chance you'll get out without losing a lap. If there's a safety car, you might be able to gain some of that ground back. You've sort of got what you've got now, I think, though, and I would imagine most of the field are going out there on slick tyres. There's a gap on the grid somewhere around the James Griffith area, I think. Callum Musian appears to be there. I'm not sure about James Griffith, number five. We'll pick up on that. Uh, I think they were out of position on the grid, weren't they? So a few drivers uh, a bit confused as to where they need to be lining up. Ben Palmer knew where he was going, though. Straight to pole position, and alongside him, Lewis Brown, the yellow and black machine, with Jack Mabin on the inside of row number two. Jack Mabin, who was a winner back at Alton Park, the only double victor in one weekend so far has been Pen Palmer last time out at Silverstone. Can Nathan Harrison do the double here? He'll have to do it from sixth on the grid. Let's find out then. The lights go out. Away we go. Round the rate of the championship bursts into life. Good start made by Harrison. He's already alongside James Gordon there. Fifth and sixth positions running towards the first corner. But it will be Palmer that leads the way. Maybe up the inside of Lewis Brown for second position. And now we start to find out where the grip is. How much rear tyre temperatures do they have? Brown has a wiggle. He's out on the grass. They're three abreast, in fact, as they go down towards the grain of curve. This could end in tears. Nathan Harrison on the inside is into second place already. Fantastic stuff that was. I think he's just about gathered it together. They're skating and sliding their way down the greater curve. Ben Palmer's loving this. He's pulling away from everybody else. But what a start from Nathan Harrison. Second position. Supreme confidence there on cold tyres in sketchy conditions. James Gordon is sideways. And crucially here, Scott, Harrison second. Gordon has gone backwards. And that will mean, because I'm going to weekend, there was about what the gap between the was about six points in the gap to Harrison's winning actually may seem pick nine points back from his 15 point gap coming into the weekend if he stays where he's effectively he can take even more points away in fact possibly James Gordon will fall back even further he's dropped back towards the bottom of the top 10 some more dramas for the championship leader tumbling down towards the back of the top 10 now battling with Harry Gooding but meanwhile Ben Palmer leads the way but Harrison taking full advantage here up into second place they'll be thinking this is perfect the more points he can take out of Gordon the more pressure he'll be on for the remaining rounds going forward to the championship and both Gordon and Harrison have had their drop score now basically Gordon not finished in race two at Silver 
Silverstone. Harrison was 23rd in race one after contact with this man, Ben Palmer, on the opening lap at Silverstone. And now Harrison trying to go around the outside to take the race lead away from Ben through the Melbourne hairpin. He's not quite going to get it, or is he? Has he got himself the inside line at Goddard's? He might just be there. Harrison up the inside from sixth on the grid in less than a lap has taken the race lead away from Ben Palmer. Yes, makes it stick at Goddard's. A phenomenal opening lap on cold tyres. And Nathan Harrison is determined not to be runner up in this championship again. He has never won the top level of the mini challenge. He's won in the Cooper class, but in the top F56 category, he always seems to fall on, fall on bad times and bad luck seems to take him out of the equation. So Harrison leads the way. Palmer second, Zelos third, Rawlings fourth, and Lewis Brown down to fifth. Maven is sixth on the grass further back. I think that's Matthew Wilson who very nearly collects uh, the uh, very lucky Calamution on that occasion. James Cornell Scott, eighth position. Not as comfortable, you would have to assume, on these cold tyres. Yeah, some are getting very sideways to the middle of the crater curves, but yeah, in cold tyres and what is an, an increasingly dropping track temperature, uh, it seems to really possibly be leaving him on the back foot. But you have to say, dare I say the phrase, that was effect Nathan Harrison's what? Ayrton said a nice 93 European Grand Prix mode, six to first in one lap on the Grand Prix circuit on what was effectively a slightly damp track. I think if you look at the back thinking, I did that, that was fantastic. That was incredible. Donington Park, you can, oh, two cars off in the background there. We'll pick up on those in a moment. Ronald Richard Newman, I think. And the one bouncing its way back on. Didn't quite it's catch Stanton, the number. I think, Josh possibly. Stanton, yeah, you're right, 99. Josh Stanton and Richard Newman, that would make sense. They were fighting over 19th place. Stanton continues, Newman doesn't. That might require a safety car. Another uh, one of the floppy markers goes for a burn. That was uh, a headbutt there from Dan Zillis to go through. Newman's out of the car, thankfully. Looks there was a bit of contact as off the road goes Stanson. Looks there was a bit of contact on the left rear, I think. So maybe there was a bit of a tag between the pair of them. Josh Stanson pulls the car off to the inside. So it means he's way off the line, which shouldn't require a safety car. Meanwhile, Harrison continues to lead the way, but Ben Palmer under threat for second place from Dan Zilos as they come back into Goddard's hairpin. Rawlings is keeping touch in fourth place, he's looking on, and in fifth position now also is Lewis Brown. But as we say, James Gauntlet is up another place now. He has managed to get past Cuff for seventh place there on the back of what is now Josh Mabian for sixth. And a good start also for Harry Gooding up to ninth place ahead of Callum who he rounds out the top ten. Through Redgate corner they go again. Then Tom Rawlings in fourth place, by the way, set to equal his best finish of the year so far from race two at Silverstone. That's Josh Stanton inspecting the damage. Now, how did he get it? Well, it looked at first viewing as if Newman lost it and Stanton had nowhere to go. Whether there was contact before that, I know not. Either way, the end result is that Newman's car is in the gravel and the safety car is being scrambled. Newman on the right there, the blue, red and white car locks up, loses the rear. And, well, Josh Stanton, really, there was nowhere he could go. He was innocent in all of that sadly, takes them both out of the race. Yeah, the question to uh, what happened to him, did he jump or was he pushed? He jumped all by himself, and sadly, he brought Stanton with him. So, uh, safety car's been deployed as a result because, of course, Newman's car is in the gravel trap, but still in the position where if someone else was to hit stride, it's an unsafe place for somebody where they could clatter into it and cause further problems. So, I think, smartly, the clerk of the course has managed to throw the safety car, which means after roughly four and a half minutes, it's a 20-minute race, we've still got plenty of time to go get it recovered. And the fact that Marshall has been so good at recovering the cars and recovering any trouble in quick succession, We've seen most of the races today only in the safety car for roughly around a couple of laps before they get them underway again. So I would anticipate, in true fashion of our fantastic British marshals, we should get Newman's car recovered pretty quick, pretty swiftly with the recovery vehicles, get this race back underway. But what this also is, one person it mainly benefits is James Gorn, because of course he's back in seventh. It closes the field back up again, which means he now has a chance to properly start to attack. Mabin, Brown, Rawlings in front to get himself back into contention for a podium place. So there's hope for Gorn yet. The race isn't over. It's only been roughly five minutes or so. He is back in seventh, yes, but there's plenty of time for him to redeem himself And what is now, I think, a track that is starting to try and dry itself back out again, even though there are still spots of rain on our commentary box window. A dejected Josh Stanton watching on there, Richard Newman explaining to the marshals his side of the story. You say this helps, Gornall. It may help Gornall. We'll find out, I suppose, in about five minutes or so. What will also happen here, though, is tyre temperature will drop off again. Any temperature they built up over the first two laps of racing will now start to go away. They won't disappear completely because they will weave side to side. They will keep the te temperatures up as much as they can. But particularly with this dropping track temperature, we know that Gordon will assume that Gordon maybe is not quite as confident on cold tyres. Maybe he was just starting to get into his comfort zone and now he's going to slip out of it. Time will tell, I suppose. James is a very experienced racer, though. The 2008 British GT champion, James Gornall, as well as a uh, former BMW Compact Cup racer. All of that success, though, in rear-wheel drive machinery. Made his debut in the Mini Challenge about halfway through last season, was straight on the pace, and everyone expected him to be a title contender this year when he announced he was campaigning for a full season. 
and indeed he has been, but might this be the race where he loses the championship lead? Well, Nathan Harrison hopes so, because he leads the way. Ben Palmer is second, Dan Zilos third, Tom Rawlings fourth, Lewis Brown is fifth, then Jack Maven, James Gordle, Rory Cuff, Harry Gooding, and Callum Newsham round out the top 10 drivers. You score points for fastest lap in this championship as well, but it's a bit different. Usually it's one or two points for the fastest lap of the race. Well, actually, if you're any one of the top six fastest drivers in the race, you can score points. There are six points available for setting the outright fastest lap, which at the moment, perhaps unsurprisingly, belongs to the race leader, Nathan Harrison. You get five points for the second fastest lap, four for the third fastest, three, two, and then one for the sixth fastest lap of the race. So if Gordon can maybe salvage some pace towards the end of the race, he might be able to scrape a few more points back. But right now, things are looking very good for Nathan Harrison. Certainly are, and as we said earlier on, in amongst the melee, um, coming into the weekend, he was 15 points ahead of Harrison. With Harrison's win earlier on, it became, it's compressed the gap down to just nine points. He took to six points because he took nine out of him in that first race. If he gets a similar result here, I think it's almost certain that when they, by the time they leave here this afternoon, he will be the championship leader, which means that now it puts even more pressure on Gornall to pick off the cars in front of him to reduce that gap and also try and score that fastest lap of the race. If Harrison wins the race, the only way that Gornall can hold on to the championship lead is if he has he is second place that's regardless of fastest laps as it stands at the moment harrison is on for 50 points for a race win gordon in seventh 30 points that's a 20 point swing before you start adding any extra points for fastest lap but there is a six point gulf between a win and second place so if you're second place that's the only way you can negate the advantage uh, for the race winner that's at the moment looking unlikely to happen but you never can truly count out james gordon and nathan harrison will know that Ben Palmer in second place, then as I said, double winner last time out, and in third position, uh, Dan Zelos. I am surprised Dan Zelos hasn't won a race this year. Dan Zelos is probably surprised he hasn't won a race this year. He's a quick driver, isn't he? He came out of Janetta Juniors, then into Renault Clio, so he has had experience of a similar sort of front-wheel drive, hot, ha hot hatchback, one-mate category. He's been there or thereabouts, he's had three podium finishes this year, never worse than eighth position. A consistent season is great, but he must want some race victories. Yeah, and possibly this could be a good chance here if he gives himself a good restart. He may be able to pick off both uh, Palmer and Harrison if they get poor restarts. But of course, remember, when this race gets underway and lots of safety car lights go out, Ben Palmer becomes the safety car for the final uh, point of that last safety car, which means he has the job of backing everyone up, getting everyone into position, and then he has to decide in a calculated fashion exactly when to pull the pin and think, right, when can I make the move now? So we see. Um, uh, Newman walking rather, de rather dejectedly, but unfortunately knowing that, sadly, kind of the incident was, unfortunately, all down to his mistake alone. It did take Josh Stanton out of the picture as a result of that. So whether the stewards want to have a word with him about that or not remains to be seen. But you can already see, even on this lap, that Nathan Harrison is just creating a bit of a gap between himself and the safety car. Look, the safety car's already down at the old head. He's already midway through the crane of curves back, back then. So he's trying to anticipate the fact that this could be the last safety car lap because looks as though that uh, the instant up at the McLean's with the Newman Stranded Mini has been cleared. So that means now we should be getting racing underway once again. But uh, yeah, going back to Dan Zelos, in third place there in the green car, he wants to try and uh, pick off the two in front and get a better restart than the two in front as best as he can and try and take advantage. Because of course, one thing that could happen is if Palmer can try and catch uh, uh, Harrison on the restart and get into a battle, all that will do is bring Zelos into play because the harder they fight each other, the easier it's going to be for the cars behind to make it to, to catch up and get themselves into the fight. We've seen that so many times today in several races, not just mini challenge. So there's every chance there that Dan Zelos is not out of this race to get some victory, but like everyone else, he's going to have to work super hard for it. I often think that on a safety car restart, if you're first or third, you've got an advantage. It's the man in second who struggles. The race leader, he dictates the pace. He is the only person who knows when the race will restart, in inverted commas, when the pace will pick up. The man in second place can only react to what the race leader does, and that has to be an instantaneous reaction, otherwise you're going to lose some ground. From third on back, you see the race leader go, and you've got a, a, a beat to react before potentially the second place car does. So really, in a way, Ben Palmer is in the most difficult position here, but he'd still rather be second than third, I'm sure, because track position is key. We saw in race one that it was surprisingly difficult to overtake, given just how competitive and how evenly matched everybody is at the sharp end of this field. We're about to go racing again. Let's see who can go on the attack here. Who has kept the tyre temperature up? Who's kept the brake temperature up as well? That's also pivotal when you arrive at Redgate Corner. You want those brakes to work. If they're a bit cold, they can be a bit snappy. You might lock up and run out wide. These are all things Nathan Harrison will have dealt with in the past, though. Ben Palmer and Dan Zelos, slightly less experienced mini-challenge racers. The same for Tom Rawlings and uh, Lewis Brown, fourth and fifth. 
Indeed, most drivers out there are less experienced than Nathan Harrison. Away he goes anyway, and there you can see the gap between first and second is fractionally bigger than the gap between second and third, because Zelos can react to damper to Ben Palmer. It wasn't a bad restart for Palmer in second place, though, and he will be only a car length or so behind Nathan Harrison, as with just over eight and a half minutes to go, we get racing back underway here at Donington Park, lap number six of the eighth round of the championship. Does anybody make a dive into Red Gate? Well, Harrison was quite conservative under braking. I think it might have started raining again slightly at that part of the circuit. And Harrison, he is the sacrificial lamb. He's the first one to arrive at every single corner. And if it has rained harder than it was raining last time they went through there, he's the first to find out. It's veterans, the unknown still here. And there's this turn the way through. Three of them already trying to break away at the front ahead of the battle of fourth and fifth between Rawlings and Brown. One is a little uh, sideways and over the grass on the exit. This brings Brown into play. Wipers ablaze on the windscreen, which means that it's Start to rain a little bit more as they come back down towards McLean's. And again, as you said, each corner now, as it is starting to rain a little bit further and further, it's basically a journey into the unknown in terms of they don't know what these conditions are like because last time they got into them, it wasn't at racing speeds, it was a reduced pace under a safety car. Up the inside goes Brown, Ooh. slightly out of control. Up the inside, the cop is caught, but somehow just about got the car stopped on the apex, is up to fourth place. An impressive move, but somehow possibly thought he wasn't going to get it stopped in time. That was the definition of a block pass, wasn't it? He got to the <laughs> apex, he threw out the anchor, made sure he didn't run out wide. It's a bit uh, unruly, maybe, but it is successful. James Gordon up the inside for sixth place, goes past Jack Mabin. That was a nice move on the break into the chicane, as Ben Palmer has Dan Zelos on the inside for second position. This is down towards the Melbourne hairpin. Dan Zelos looked racy just before the safety car came out. He's into second, and Harrison has not gone anywhere, so Dan Zelos might just be able to get this first victory of the season. But to do that, he has to overtake one of the most experienced drivers on the grid. Nathan Harrison will not roll over and let him go, especially if he's being told that uh, James Gordle is starting to make progress as well. There is Gordle, the uh, yellow and white car, just ahead of Jack Mabin at number seven. Across the start-finish line they go. Seven minutes of racing remaining. Can Dan Zelos do this? Maybe with the talking up we did finally, first of all, it won't be a commentator's curse, it'll be a commentator's blessing this time. <laughs> so many times we say about somebody's going to do a, good, do a good job and they fall off the road. Maybe, hopefully, this time for the first time ever, it could be the polar opposite. Uh, yes, well, we get in trouble so often for cursing people. It would be nice to be praised <laughs> for picking them up for once, wouldn't it? As I say, though, this is not going to be easy. Nathan Harris will put up a, a severe fight here, I'm sure. Rain may be easing off now. They'll have built some tyre temperature up as well, so Nathan will no doubt be looking to try and use that confidence to extend the margin. Zeloff, remember, was third this morning and only 1.2 seconds off the race victory, such was the close nature of the, uh, the leading pack. Certainly seems to be a similar sort of story today, uh, or this afternoon, I should say. Towards the back of shot, James Gordle has now latched onto the tail of Tom Rawlings. There he goes. Sixth position, James Gordle led the points leader. Needs to try and make more ground up than this. Gordle's fastest lap at the moment is a 41.8, which would be about the third or fourth fastest lap, I think, as the conditions continue to improve. If they continue to improve, though, we should start to see, indeed, lots of purple seconds coming up again now on this, the first full flying lap after the safety car. Blue car there, Rory Cuff behind him, Callum Newsham and Harry Gooding still inside the top ten. As Ben Palmer defends from Lewis Brown. And on the inside goes James Gordon for fifth position. Tom Rawlings, really, there was very little he could do there. Gordon was coming through. Yeah, fantastic pass. A little bit of a lock-up as he's trying to get the car anchored up, but classy move there from the former British GT champion to get himself the move done. What's interesting here is that Zelos might possibly be the marker post for the cars behind because he might be possibly thinking, rather than being, being, being with Palmer holding up Zelos in many cases, possibly this might be thinking, right, let me go and try and come with me so we can try and chase after because the more cars that are stacking up behind Harrison, the more pressure he's under, the more pressure you might get. Meanwhile, James Gordon, we said it might be important to get the fastest lap of the race. He's done just that with a 141.005 fractions away from doing a sub-141, which would be a pretty impressive lap time, especially in these sort of mixed conditions here, when it's sort of half mostly dry, with a little bit of precipitation in the air and a little bit of saturation on the circuit. Another drive to keep an eye on if we ever dare take our eyes off the lead pack is Lee Patterson, the grey number 69 car, running in 14th position, just did the outright fastest final sector, and he has set a lap time that I reckon is the second fastest lap in the race, 1-1,000 quicker than Lewis Brown has gone. There is Lewis Brown, meanwhile, fourth on the road, attacking Ben Park for the third position, but Lee Patterson from the back of the grid after that mysterious issue that took him out of the first race early doors is starting to trouble the back end of the top ten now. Back out of Coppice goes this third place scrap. Lewis Brown looking strong here. Lewis's best finish so far has been a fifth. He's yet to have a podium in his mini challenge uh, JCW racing career. Can he do it now? Ben Palmer is the man that stands between him and that. What would be a fantastic result. 
I think James Gordon has got some tyre temperature now. He's found some commitment through the chicane, that's for sure. He used lots of curve, and he is catching these two. Can't blame him for it. Can't blame him for not trying, can you? Because he's up the inside for uh, that's Jack Maven defending at the passing, actually. Rawlings for sixth position. So a clean move up the inside, a la Gordon that did on him a couple of laps ago. So certainly taking inspiration, thinking, right, anything he can do, I can try Ooh. and do it better. Up the inside for third. Great opportunistic pass for Lewis Brown. And parks it straight on the air. Picked up. It was a great move on Ben Palmer. Got him completely off guard. Think, right, if you're going to sit in the middle of the track, bang, up the inside line, up to third place. Ben won't like that. He'll try and get him back past the next few corners. But a cracking move. And he's going to try back up the inside again. He must be listening to me in the comedy box. Diving up the inside, but he may be too deep, or he might not be. Palmer parks up the air and thinks, if you're going to park it there, I'm going to do exactly the same thing. Side by side down the crane of curves. And look who it's bringing back into play. James Gornall will throw himself into the mix. He could go for third to fifth here if he plays his cards right, Andy. Yeah, Ben Palmer's all out of shape on the dirty side of the road through the crane of curves. But that was some fantastic racing. The last of the late breakers there for Lewis Brown into the head. And then Ben Palmer through Redgate. Palmer might have made the corner, actually, if he hadn't had that headbutt from Palmer. Either way, Brown has managed to, uh, to go through and uh, he is into third position then. Palmer for Gordle with them. So too, Jack Mabin and Tom Rawlings. It's letting the top two rather check out. And on the previous lap, Zelos was fractionally quicker than Nathan Harrison, so we may yet have a fight for the lead on our hands. For the podium place, though, for the bottom podium place, it is any one of five drivers. They make their way down the exhibition straight. Two and a half minutes to go. Maybe, by the way, Scott has set the new fastest lap of the race, so we are definitely seeing conditions improve here. Yeah, it was a sub 141 lap time, 140.979, so he managed to do what James Gould couldn't on the previous lap. But Lewis Brown really is off the clock in the bottom. up the inside now for fourth place goes James Gould. He managed to find his way through. He locks up and this may also open the door for Jack Maven to make his way through. Palmer runs wide on the exit. Maven says, thank you very much. I'll take that. But he's on the outside line for the next corner, which may not be to his benefit. As Gornall parks the car in the middle of the road to try and defend from either Palmer or Maven. Tucked in behind Lewis Brown as they turn their way through. Palmer goes back up the outside and says, not quite this time, Josh. He comes back on the exit through Goddard's. But the top two trying to break away. We've got less than two minutes to go. Z loss was matching, his last up to was a fraction slower than Harrison, so the gap is pretty stationary at this point in time. But Gornall now wants to try and get himself back into a third place position to try and minimise that deficit of points, which is going to lose to Harrison. His main task now, he can't catch the top two. He has to get past Brown here to try and nullify the points advantage that Harrison has if he's got any chance of trying to hold on to the lead. Although getting sideways through the middle of the crane of curves is not the tactic he wants to try and employ. If he finishes third and Harrison wins, he will lose 10 points to Nathan Harrison before you add in the fastest laps. But Gornall's fastest lap is still quicker than Harrison's. Jack Maybin, the only man I think that's been into the 1 minute 40 now, 1 minute 40.979. He's on course for the six bonus points for fastest lap. But Gornall, by my reckoning, would take five bonus points. Harrison, maybe only two or three. So uh, you're looking at a net gain at the moment for Harrison of about seven or eight points, and he's six points behind. What is pivotal for Nathan is that Dan Zelos doesn't get past him and take the race lead away, because that could really change things. And on this lap, Zelos has set a personal best in the first sector and the middle sector. In the middle sector, he was one one thousandth of a second faster than the race leader, but the gap is creeping down. Down the hill they come, the green car of Dan Zelos looking for his first ever win, applying the pressure there to Harrison. Meanwhile, it's two yellow cars side by side for third, and James Gornall taking a risk there by going to the outside of the Melbourne hairpin. Yes, he wants this third place, but he cannot afford contact that could lead to a second on finish. I think I saw his tactic that he was trying to get to the outside line to get himself on the inside for the next corner, but Lewis was wise to that and just covered that inside line and gave him just enough uh, enough of a squeeze to force him to back out of that move as we head on to the last lap of the race. But look at all this battling here, still bringing in the likes of Palmer, maybe Rawlings in the mix. Dan Zelos, though, more crucially, set the fastest lap of the race a tenth quicker than Harris, who set his personal best and come back into Redgate for the final time. Brown is literally hanging on for dear life in this third place, but Gaul, the experience as he is, will keep on putting the pressure on all the way through this final tour of the Grand Prix loop to try and snatch the third place away. The question is, Andy, how bad does he want it, or how calculated does he want to be to sit and take the fourth place and possibly try and gain the points back later on? It's a difficult decision to make with half a lap to go. Windscreen wipers off for Lewis Brown as well. Now, whether he's flicked them on in excitement or because there are a few more spots of rain falling, I'm not too sure. At the pit straight, I don't think it's raining, but at the far end of the track, it may be a different story. The rear of Lewis Brown's car certainly does not look particularly well balanced. Again, is that because of his exuberance trying to keep Gordon at bay or because of some slightly more slippery conditions? In the first sector on this lap, the lead gap is coming down by another tenth, but all eyes really on the fight for third place. Lewis Brown doing everything he can to hang on to take his first podium finish. James Gordon really could do with getting past, though. He needs these championship points. 
you know, I think Lewis Brown is the only driver with uh, windscreen wipers on, so uh, I think maybe he's caught the switch whilst he was saving one of the many sideways moments he's had over the last lap and a half. The leading two, though, down to the Melbourne hairpin. Half a second in, it's at the line. Zelos throwing everything at this. What about for third place? It's still Lewis Brown hanging on. We may see Rory Cuff getting past Tom Rawlings in the background. He's up the inside in the blue car. But that will give him the outside line for the final corner. Into the final corner, then, come the top two. And Nathan Harrison is going to do exactly what Ben Palmer did at Silverstone last time out, winning two races in the same weekend. He gets his first win this morning. And like buses, the second one is not far behind. A brilliant double race victory for Nathan Harrison, second is Zelos, third is Brown, just about fends off James Gordon in fourth, Ben Palmer fifth, Jack Mabin sixth, then Tom Rawlings, Rory Cuff, Callum Newsham, and Lee Patterson just got into the top ten, I think on the final lap, at the expense of Harry Gooding, a really good drive that, as you'd expect from the hugely experienced uh, front-wheel drive tip top racer Lee Patterson, from the back of the grid, gets into the top ten. Well, a sublime drive that from Nathan Harrison. He was in many ways the star of the show at Silverstone because after having that 23rd place finish in race one, he came through from the 23rd place on the grid to finish second in race two at Silverstone and very nearly won it. Here today, he stayed out of trouble. He's kept good track position and he was impossible to beat. He's had two very controlled and very professional and two very mature drives today. So I think certainly if he counts exactly as he is in this season, of course, James Gordon will, will ha can't afford to have many more sort of slightly off days than he had this weekend. Of course, he got second in race one earlier on this, this morning, and of course, then it was fourth in the second race. If he keeps on falling back and allowing Harrison to keep on racking up these wins, Harrison keeps on this consistent form, really, he's got to be the main favourite for the championship. And now James Gordon's got to try and find as much pace as he can, but then the next few rounds coming up at Browns Hatch, Donington Park back here once again, and then Sness in October. He's got to do as much as he can now to try and stop Harrison from getting these perfect weekends of picking up two wins, both from pole position. He's got to try as much as he can to push himself back into the mix. And that first lap in particular for Harrison, from sixth to first, that was crucial. He managed to make up a lot more time, whereas James Gorn was the one that went backwards, back to eighth position, and that put him on the back foot for the rest of the race. So a cracking first lap was the key to what saw Nathan Harrison pick up that second win. And kudos to Dan Zelos too for a superb drive to pick up second and putting him under pressure all the way through into the chequered flag. It was a cracking first lap for Nathan Harrison. It was, a, in a way, an even better last lap. It was a personal best lap, which meant that he set the second fastest lap of the race. No only missed out on fastest lap by four one thousandths of a second. Dan Zelos takes the six points for the fastest lap, but Harrison crucially will score 50 for a win and then a bonus five points for the second fastest lap of the race. So by my reckoning, he moves on to 365 points. James Gordon will score 37 points for finishing fourth, three points for setting the fourth fastest lap time. 356 is his tally. So nine, sorry, 11 points. No, right, first time, nine points the advantage for Nathan Harrison over James Gordon. So Harrison has taken the championship lead and is further ahead of Gordon now than Gordon was going into that second race of the weekend. So a really pivotal race. Gordon didn't have a bad race. He started uh, from fifth on the grid, but he was down to about seventh or eighth on that one. It was a good drive to fight back to fourth, but because of the way the point system works, it really rewards race victories, which I like. And Nathan Harrison has reaped those rewards today with two of them, two race victories and some good fastest lap points as well. Lewis Brown on the podium. Dan Z lost that first win, though, for Dan. It surely is going to come, isn't it, before the end of the season. He could do with it to try and really close in on the top two in the championship, but still an impressive couple of uh, races this weekend for Dan. Yeah, he's certainly shown all the front-wheel driving expertise that he has, of course, over the last couple of years racing Clear Cup. He seems to have adapted pretty much seamlessly into minis. Of course, going forward, of course, he wants to do a second season where hopefully if he can carry on this form to potentially get himself into championship contention. He is still there or thereabouts. Of course, he came into the weekend fourth on points. He managed to, I think, move ahead of Ben Palmer after that first race, and that strong result will surely seem to take even more points away and from Palmer maintaining his third position, of course, and that means that his next target, surely, has to try and eat into the advantage that James Gordon has in second place to try and get through. But uh, Nathan Harrison, of course, nice and cool and composed as he gets out of the car, and uh, I'm sure that he'll be uh, very delighted with his weekends work. I'm sure he's going to go over and uh, shake the hand of Dan Zeals, which he does. Well done. Of course, Lewis Brown's going to be delighted, of course, as well, as we said. Before this weekend, he hadn't scored a podium in the championship this season, but he'll come away with some silverware with third place. So good to see him. But uh, I have to say, for someone who's just won a race and taken two victories, Nathan Harrison looks very <laughs> subdued and calm and composed, doesn't he? He's usually, you get these two different types of graded driver. You get other drivers that get very sort of excited and up, up, upbeat and kind of really sort of happy that they've won a race. And others who just think, yeah, just all one day's work. Nice and simple, nice and straightforward. <laughs> Bit of an exasperated look there, thinking, 
it was it may, it may have looked simple but it probably wasn't by any, any, any margin in the slightest was it now nathan harrison is not the most excitable of fellows and that's possibly a good trait in a racing driver nathan harrison then your double race winner here at donnington and takes the championship lead provisionally at least dan zelos is second lewis brown is third james gordon loses the points lead but won't be far behind as we head to the next round of the championship at brands hatch then it's ben palmer fifth jack Mabin sixth tom rawling Ro tom rawlings rory cup and callum newsham with lee patterson getting into the top 10 then harry gooding james luke jack davidson matthew wilson and james mcintyre to round out the top 15. outside of that top 15 then it was a 16th place for lewis gayler 17th keenan dole 18th for Max Bird, a bit of a disappointing weekend for him. Then Neil Trotter and Jacob Andrews with Matt Rainbow and Stuart Gibbs, the last of your finishers. Josh Stanton and Richard Newman tangled at McLean's and retired and brought out the safety car. Nathan, congratulations. Great race. You must be very pleased with that. Yeah, and I'm over the moon. It's, it's been a bang on weekend. We've qualified P1, we had P1 and now race two on a reverse grid from P6 to P1. So no. Boys at Accelerate and Mini have done a top job all weekend. We've worked together, We've got some good results out of it. But I'd like to say thank you to my sponsors, Alligator and Warburton's, because if it weren't for these people, I wouldn't be here racing. But no, it's been a top weekend. It's always a tough fight in the Minis, so it must be a great way to finish the weekend. You must be happy with that. Yeah, yeah, the Minis are not hard. There's so many good talent out there, so much talent. And um, especially with them conditions, it started spitting. I was thinking, oh, it's going to be craners. Some people are going to be turning off, spinning. But no, it was right. It was just keeping it back, being steady, and that's it. We got the lead then, drove away. Well done. Thanks very much. Cheers, thank you. Well, there you go then. Nathan Harrison, your race winner. And uh, as we said, very calm and collected Nathan Harrison. But if he could finally wrap up this title in 2019, after so many years of trying and coming very, very close, then I think we might see a bit more emotion out of the perennial runner-up in this championship. Highlights then of the eighth round of Mini Challenge UK, the F56 class, the JCWs, a brilliant start from pole position it was initially uh, for Ben Palmer, but keep an eye on Nathan Harris. And the dark green car was fourth into turn one. He was second by the time they got to the old hairpin on lap one. Richard Newman and Josh Stanton tangled at McLean's, unfortunately. Stanton pulled off. Newman was stranded in the gravel and the safety car had to be called for. On the restart, Dan Zelos nicked up the inside of Ben Palmer for second position, whilst further back, James Gordle was also making ground. Palmer fought back up the inside of Lewis Brown at Redgate. There was a bit of contact. Brown went back through and Gordle joined in the fun as well. James was determined to try and get some points out of this race with his big rival Harrison taking the win. And the second fastest lap, though, it was Nathan that will leave Donington Park the points leader. Zelos was second in the race. Lewis Brown hung on to his first podium, whilst Gordle salvaged decent points for fourth position, but will lose the championship lead. A brilliant double race victory then for Nathan Harrison here at Donington Park. Next, the championship heads to Brands Hatch, first on the Indy, then the Grand Prix circuit. Who will come out on top there?